from the storyboard i'm shubani gharat in a special conversation with storyboard 18 we are catching up with tyler turnbull global ceo fcb group who was on his first visit to the country in 2024 and after all the leadership overhaul at fcb group in india he spoke to us about the tasks earmarked for the leadership and how are they bolstering their capabilities in the country why do they shy away from representing political parties in elections and will dhirat sena be turn bulls turn around guy in this market tyler welcome to cnbc tv 18 thank you so this is your first visit to the country in 2024 yes the past 4 months of 2024 how have they been for you and for fcb listen i mean we're coming off a very strong 2023 globally from an fcb mm-hmm. perspective and i think the reason for that is because of our people and our belief in the economic power of creativity and so when you think about the work that we've been able to develop for some of the world's biggest brands we're proving day in and day out the results that we can drive in today's climate and when i think about what we've done here in india in the last 3 to 4 months mm-hmm. we've obviously brought in a new group level ceo in duraj who's been yeah, yeah. phenomenal uh and we have four incredible agencies here that have really hit their stride we've had one of our most successful quarters in india uh in our history Uh we've seen incredible growth through new business wins and launching new work across brands like Google, uh like Tata EV, many others. And I think I see an agency and a group here that's really hit its stride. Uh and that's really I think delivering amazing work for some amazing brands both inside India and out. Sure, sure. I was going to ask you about India expectations, but before that, yes. as you mentioned, yes. new leadership in the country yes. under of course uh, dhiraj yep. sinha so uh, he he took charge around 6 uh, months ago yeah. around yep. end september so what is his 6 months report card like according oh to my you? gosh i mean first of all if you've met dhiraj you know the type of energy that he brings and when i was looking for our new leader i wanted someone who I think first and foremost believed in creative as much as as I do and that we do globally. Mm-hmm. I think second someone who had a track record of building great teams and great agencies. And third someone who has a modern view of what clients want and where clients are going. And Dhiraj to me had the perfect blend of creative passion, technology experience and a data-driven mindset as a former planner uh, and strategist. who I was really attracted to from an FCB perspective. His first 6 months have been phenomenal. He is bringing in incredible talent from inside India as well as outside. And I think he's really brought together our four agencies in an incredible way. Uh so I if I were to give him a grade, I would definitely give him an A uh because it's been a very <laughs> fast transition. um and he's done i think incredible things so a for dhiraj it is yay yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know 10 years ago when you joined fcb yes, group yes. as uh, the ceo of canada yep. you were known as the turnaround guy <laughs> for canada yeah uh th- from 35th rank you brought the agency to right up to the top yes so do you expect dhiraj to be the turnaround guy in the country Listen, I think I wouldn't say we're in a turnaround here in the same situation that I was certainly in a number of years ago. I think sure. we're much stronger from a creative perspective and team perspective. I think what Diraj can do in the next couple of years is really define for our clients how to show up and how to partner with a proper agency ecosystem. I think what I've seen in our other markets around the world is clients today they want to sim- simplify their model with their mm-hmm. agencies. they want more accountability and they want partners who can provide end-to-end services across the entire marketing mix and what Diraj has been able to do and our teams have been able to do i think through some amazing brands like Interface and Alka obviously FCB India and Connect mm. is we can help clients across the entire spectrum of what mm. they're doing in a way that i think is very unique uh, in this market sure sure and under him as well there is a fresh batch of leadership so what are some yes. of the tasks that you have cut out for uh, the new ceos that you have roped in for your respective agencies under him first and foremost what we look at globally is are we making work that our clients are proud of and that the market loves and so every agency is very focused on unleashing that creativity everywhere secondly we are investing in places where clients are investing so in areas like performance or in social or in technology we really feel like there's an opportunity to apply creativity there like never before 
And what excites me is the canvas for our creative product has never been larger. Mm. But I think in many ways, we haven't unleashed it as an industry uh, in areas like social or influencer or CX, UX, in the same way that we have other traditional so channels. So bolstering those uh, areas as well is uh, yes. something that you are looking forward for to. For sure. I mean, we look at, we launched FCB6 here in India uh, mm -hmm. just over 10 months ago. The growth of that unit specifically has been phenomenal in India and for mm -hmm. us around the world. And really the premise for that was helping clients who've taken big platforms and implementations like Salesforce and apply a more creative lens to their communications within those platforms. What are some of the challenges facing the agency business today? Is it uh, you know, shrinking margins? Is it the talent pool? Yeah. Is it you know, uh, the volatile macroeconomic and geopolitical situation? Yes. What is it, what, or anything else apart from that? Listen, I think the biggest challenge that we face globally is the pressure on consumers. Right? and related to those issues that you mentioned. We look at the two wars, the inflation, certainly the interest rates, which I think consensus-wide would be higher for longer. I don't think they're coming down globally as fast as some have predicted. And that puts a ton of pressure on consumers, which then goes into their spending and their investment habits. And so I think about your question really by category as well. Right? We work in many different categories from financial to travel to airlines to CPG. Hmm. Each of those categories is being impacted in different ways. Sure. In some cases, I think because in many markets people aren't buying homes anymore, their investments are going into places like travel and areas like never before. In others, we've seen pullback in places like luxury, as an example, where because of the day-to-day -day pressures on cost of, cost of goods living, and food, yeah. there's been a big transition there. So that creates, I think, a level of uncertainty amongst our clients, which from an industry standpoint on our end, makes it very hard to kind of predict in terms of where their spend mm -hmm. could be going. I think secondly, the value of creativity has to be fought for more than ever before. I think as an industry, we can sometimes get very focused on data and targeting and personalization at scale, all things I personally am very passionate about, but we can't lose sight of the economic value of what we can drive. And so from an FCB perspective, what we've been very focused on is changing our commercial model to have shared skin in the game with our clients so that when they win and we are selling more and growing their share and delivering day in and day out, we are, are getting some of that benefit as well. And I think that's been more attractive because I think for many clients, the classic advertising model has to change, which has been primarily time-based and people-based. We are moving much more into deliverables and outcomes. Yeah, and 2024, a lot of elections are also happening yes. all over the world. That's right. I believe 64 to 65 elections yep. in different countries. Are, are you as FCB uh, group participating in any of those elections in terms of, you know, representing a political party in some of the countries? We do not. The so we do not do political advertising worldwide, both at the FCB level and at IPG. But obviously that has a huge Any impact Any reason on to us. shy away from political advertising? Um, I think it's just, we have, we have specialists within our PR world and different communications areas that I think are, are, um, are more focused in those spaces. But I would say from an FCB perspective, we really want to represent the consumer, right? And I think we've seen polarization, certainly, of, of side taking in different markets. And I think many brands today, they want to appeal to a wide base of consumer not just a specific subset that aligns themselves to a, a political party. We were hearing rumors that the group in India was approached by a certain political party. <laughs> I can't I can't comment on that. I just got here. <laughs> okay. Moving away from politics, let's speak about AI now. And yes. AI is changing almost every sector yep. for good. Uh, tell us your first, your opinion on AI and its impact on advertising. I mean, it will be massive. I think that AI is going to impact really three areas across our agency. First is the workforce, hmm. second is the workplace, and third is our work itself. Hmm. And so from a workforce perspective, we've been very focused on training and having enterprise-wide partnerships with some of the major platforms hmm. so that people can start to experiment with, with LLMs, with yeah. prompts, yeah, yeah. and get a sense of how that could impact it could work. Sure. Second in the workplace, we're really focused on, I think, a lot of the foundational elements that hmm. AI could impact. So for example, Right now, we have very labor-intensive parts of our process, scoping for mm -hmm. clients, mm -hmm. or new business RFIs and responses. 
we're making our own custom FCB LLMs now mm -hmm. that take all of our best kind of work from around the world and will mm -hmm. give our people a faster kind of shorthand mm -hmm. to answer some of those questions. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for this wonderful conversation, Tyler. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it is now time for a short break. On the other side, we are speaking with former CEO of Z5, Tarun Katyal, who has launched Koto, an app which is focused on building a safe space for women online. Welcome back. A veteran in media and entertainment space and former CEO of Z5, Tarun Katya last year launched Koto, an app which is focused on building a safe space for women online. At the outset, Koto is a Reddit-like forum which can be simply described as a community platform offering support, resources, opportunities and interaction for anyone seeking it. Members can join various communities where users can discuss anything and everything from periods, menstrual health, mental health, career, relationships, achievements and more. Just like any other social media platform, they can also post content, comment, report, discuss and connect with other users. Besides the social media functions, they can set up online merch stores or sell products to other users through this app. Users can also use it to offer courses, consultations, boot camps, workshops and earn money. To tell us more, we are joined in by Tarun himself. Tarun, welcome to CNBC TV 18. Thank you so much. So it has been a year since you launched Koto. Uh, share with us some significant milestones over the past one year and how is it helping women? So Koto stands for come together, right? Mm. Uh, when we came up with the idea, we knew that women needed a safe space to be able to have the kind of conversations that they don't end up having, right? The current social media platforms end up allowing you to do a lot of vanity or, mm. or have become a platform for vanity, right? So what you did last night, we're not talking about anything more than what you need to know, but <laughs> the parties you went to, the way you look, so on and so forth. Hmm. Uh, but we needed a space where, which was far more purposeful, right? Um, and what really happened as we launched the platform, the first few communities were all around health and well-being. Um, and there are now 7,000, over 7,000 communities on the platform. The largest chunk is around uh, health and wellness. Hmm. And uh, that being mental health, sexual health, menstrual health, relationship counseling and coaching, a little bit about astro. And then, there, yes, there is beauty and fashion and so on and so forth. But, you know, some of these and their variants around that with PCOS, menopause, mm. or dating, or dating advice for Gen Z, or heartaches, or even anxiety, depression. Some of those have actually come out as the big, uh, you know, big PMF for us. Mm. What we also realized was that you know, these community creators were really good experts themselves. So the big first step that we've taken into monetization is consultation commerce. Hmm. Because all of these clinical psychologists, therapists, you know, relationship coaches, um, uh, nutritionists who have set up these communities, uh, they do a great job in answering questions. There are about a million Q&As that have been done on the platform, right? And, hmm. and the content creation journey itself is built around Q&A. But when you want one-on-one -on -one personal advice, hmm. that's where we've started to build consultation commerce. Hmm. And that's the big uh, leap we are taking from 1st of May, which is where uh, women experts who go live now hmm. on the platform, much like you go live here, hmm. also have an option to be able to answer questions at a per-minute cost basis to anybody who wants to talk to them. So there's hmm. real consultations to be done on the platform. They can be video one-on-one -on -one consultation, they can be audio, hmm. they can be text, hmm. they can be anonymous. You can choose uh, who you want to talk to and at what price point and, do you want to talk to. And how will it work? How will it uh, help uh, those who are, uh, uh, you know, giving the consultation? So they end up keeping the revenue, a yeah. large chunk of their and revenue. And the platform? With them. The platform keeps a platform cut with that, right? Okay. So it's a it's a good win-win. This is very interesting. If you can share with examples, you know, how it has helped some of the women, some of the female users on the platform. You know, women who are going through PCOS, right? Mm. They have uh, irregular periods. They have mood swings. They don't know what should they should do, whether mm. they should change their diet patterns, whether they should change their lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, these conversations are nearly absent, right? Uh, mm. You have the option to go anonymous. 
you have the option to be able to talk to the right kind of expert and find the right kind of community and answer, ask your questions, get a lot of answers. And also a lot of like-minded women who are, you know, who've gone through the same yeah, experience, same issues. The yeah. same issues. They come and, you know, uh, participate in these, right? There are women who are going through divorce. They're when, you know, when you hmm. decide if you want to separate with your spouse, hmm. you can't even talk to your own immediate family because the immediate family is going to tell you don't do it. Yeah. Right? And you're... You're ashamed to talk to your friends because they will judge you. So how do you go find first step you know, of help, right? Mm. And a lot of the legal communities end up becoming the starting point of people starting to think, right? That I'm going through harassment. What should I do? What are my options? Mm. What can be my next step? And then having said that, because there is a lot of sensitive information, personal information shared on the platform. Having said that, you can also explain to us how do you keep it safe? So... Every question, you have the choice to keep it anonymous. Hmm. And every after every answer, you have a choice to not share it outside. Hmm. And then you have the choice to make the community fully private. And so that you have a request to join and the community owner decides whether you can even be allowed into the community. Hmm. So we've actually gated it at many, many levels. Even the live feeds, we have a choice to, uh, to join them anonymous and even ask your question hmm. anonymously and only ask your questions privately. Hmm. So... We've made sure that you can decide to choose to reveal your identity at every single level. So it doesn't mean that you've entered the app, now it's on public. Yeah. Currently, it's disallowing men uh, to be a part of this platform and we've discussed this. Uh, Tarun, going forward, will this disallowing men to be on Koto continue or you will eventually start allowing men? So, you know, in the future that I know of, right, today, we are never going to allow men into the community areas ever, right? Because we have committed to the safety and security of women. Women have had these conversations in their own identity or anonymously on the platform without worrying about somebody will come in or not. Hmm. And we cannot breach that ever, right? Hmm. Uh, there could be aspects of live consultations and others where a service provider may want to be willing to provide services hmm. to men that could be kept outside of the community area where this could happen, but that is also not envisaged, at least in the next few years. It is time for a short break. On the other side, we are meeting Ravi Santhanam, Group Head and CMO, HDFC Bank, and speaking to him about the changes in marketing a bank, their campaign against financial fraud and much more. Welcome back. In a special chat, we caught up with Ravi Santhanam, Group Head and CMO, HDFC Bank. He spoke to us about the changes in marketing a bank, their campaign against financial fraud, how is tech shaping their business and much more. Listen in. We have seen how, you know, this sector and especially banks, different banks across uh, this sector have gone through this major transformation journey over the past two, three years. Uh, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is data modernization or, you know, digital platform enhancement, uh, you know, that uh, has happened over the past uh, two, three years owing to the pandemic. Tell us where does the marketing function sit in this entire equation and how has the role of marketing a bank changed over the past two, three years? Oh, it's an interesting question. <clears throat> the first thing is marketing is almost central to the whole transformation that we are talking about. Because marketing is asked to take these offerings to the customers. Mm. And since marketing is the one which actually controls all the channels of communication that we have with the customers, it is almost at the centerpiece of this transformation. The engineering activities that are happening, consumers are not necessarily interested in that. They're all interested in what it does for them. them. In terms yeah. of How does it matter? solve for their, solve for their problems. problems? And so starting from the narrative and actually taking it to the consumer is the marketing's job. What has also changed uh, in the same direction is marketing was not necessarily a revenue-led function. Hmm. Today, in the bank specifically, we are a revenue-led function and I keep calling myself as a revenue-led marketer, revenue marketer, because today we have targets to sell credit cards, to directly sell loans and everything. And we do a very good job out of it because all the digital properties we communicate, yeah. we're able to reach to the customers across the multiple properties that we have. Hmm. And since the digital journeys are available now, we are able to convert the customer directly into a sale. Yeah, and that has also given you a seat at the table, uh, exactly. so to speak, over the past uh, two, three years. Uh, tell us some of the trends, okay? What are some of the things that customers are looking for and how is a bank fulfilling that need gap? 
See, the way we see it is, uh, it's a supply constrained economy, it's not a demand constrained economy. Mm. Almost most of the people are now very comfortable with e-commerce, buying everything on the online side. When it comes to banking products and services, it was more a supply that was not available mm. and not a demand. Mm. People are willing to go ahead and do everything online. So banking services on the transaction side, they were all doing it online. So 94% of our transactions are anyway digital today. Mm. But only the purchasing side, whether to open an account or to take a new loan or to apply for a card, mm. that was not happening digitally. Mm. It was more about an application form they will fulfill, they will write in the digital formats and then still the manual process will continue. Sure. What we have done is we have taken the current India stack, whether it is the Aadhaar, whether it is the GST availability, whether it is the account aggregator framework, and we have created on-the-fly credit decisioning journeys where any customer in the country today, anybody in the country today, can come in, mm. apply for their products, mm. and if they are good in terms of credit and everything, and the past history is available, and they are willing to give us the data points, they're able to sanction a card and send it to them in a matter of 10 minutes. Having said that, you know, the number of scams and frauds also have increased over the past uh, two, three years is what we have seen. Someone, let's say a senior citizen is really scared to like, you know, transact at all digitally because, you know, probably someone in their family has yeah, warned sure. them against scams and uh, uh, everything that is happening around, scams or frauds that are happening around. Uh, so tell us, uh, you know, one of the campaigns that, uh, you know, we saw from HDFC Bank was with Vigilante, which was launched like a couple of months ago. How did that, uh, you know, how did you come up with that idea and uh, how, what has it done for HDFC Bank? See, what we have seen is when people are talking, people have been talking about online frauds for almost five years. We have been talking about it in multiple formats, in multiple stories and all. We started with Moob Bandraku. At that time, there was COVID that was happening. Everybody wanted to wear a mask and everybody wanted to or needed to wear a mask. So we said, close your mouth and also don't share your OTP and CVV during that point of time. We always wanted to see how we can innovate and actually get to the audience to look at it. Hmm. And uh, most of the stories and the narratives that are happening on the fraud space were all very, very boring and dull. Hmm. And we said, why not we create our own intelligent, our own influencer, hmm who is actually going to be the spokesperson mm -hmm. and uh, people are not interested in ads, people are interested in content, people are interested in watching what the content and what the story is all about. So can we create our own in uh, influencer who will talk about frauds maybe in a nice jovial manner and will that content reach out and that's why we started Vigilante two years back and there's a second year running. We got tremendous uh, response from our customers as well as the Indian citizenry about what Vigilante is doing for them whatever frauds are happening, whatever fr newer frauds that could happen potentially, we are able to cover it in a very, very nice, jovial way and people are partnering with us to actually spread the message around. Sure, sure. And how did it work, uh, you know, for the brand? Also, uh, recently you tried to scam, as a bank, you tried to scam the consumers. Um, you know, tell us more about, uh, you know, coming okay, up. Okay, you put it in a very different way. Yeah. We tried to scam the consumer to save the consumer. <laughs> so that's what I will uh, put it as. And off late, the biggest one which has been happening is the defect controversies. Mm. And when it was happening, we always thought it like, okay, this is a controversy happening on defect. And we also have heard stories of how defect is being used to fraud. One of the biggest stories fraud that people, we heard yeah. is like they are actually recording in your son's voice or in your daughter's voice. Yeah, or WhatsApp or videos of, uh, of, you know, like friends calling you sure. in, uh, in need. So these kind of things were happening and not much in number, but it's slowly and steadily starting. And uh, there is an optimism bias in people. Hmm. There is something which we believe, like for example, a person like me will always believe like I am not going to be scammed because at the end of the day, I'm very, very cautious about it. I understand the digital world and all the stuff. Hmm. But people are waiting always for that one emotional moment where you will fall prey. Hmm. And very recently we get a call. My son is studying in uh, Delhi in medical school. Hmm. My wife is getting a call saying that something has happened to my son and you immediately have to pay so much of money hmm. and she just laughed it off. Hmm. And that's the kind of thing because at that point of time, your first interest is to do all these stuff in terms of saying, okay, don't do anything, I'll help you, whatever it is. So we said, why not take this opportunity and try and create something hmm. which will ensure people know about what deep fake frauds could be potentially. Hmm. And that's how the idea started and so we went ahead and executed. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure.
With that, it's a wrap on Storyboard this week. You can catch all of our content on Facebook, X and YouTube. Thanks for watching. We will be back same time next week. See you soon.